wanted to share with you just quickly before, in fact, it will be our introduction to Bishop Morlino this evening, who really needs no introduction at the Institute of Catholic Culture. He's a great defender of the faith. And as I watched Pope John Paul II in this video, uh, I was reminded of Bishop Morlino and the struggle he has had and continues to have to, to ensure that orthodoxy remains prevalent, that it's available to those whom he is shepherding. Uh, and so I'll share this video with you. Some of you may have watched it online already. Se si deve parlare di un rinnovamento, di una rigenerazione della società umana, anzi della Chiesa come società degli uomini si deve cominciare da questo punto da questa missione chiesa santa di dio tu non puoi fare la tua missione non puoi compiere la tua missione nel mondo se non attraverso la famiglia e la sua missione noi siamo immersi attraverso il sacramento dell'acqua e dello Spirito Santo immersi in questo, in questo mistero mistero pasquale di Cristo la sua morte e sua resurrezione siamo immersi per ritrovare la pienezza della vita e quella pienezza dobbiamo ritrovarla nella dimensione della persona ma nello stesso tempo nella dimensione della famiglia, comunione delle persone, per portare, ispirare con questa novità di vita i diversi ambienti, le società, i popoli, le culture, la vita sociale, la vita economica, tutto questo, tutto questo per la famiglia, sì, voi dovete andare dappertutto nel mondo per ripetere a tutti per la famiglia non a costo della famiglia ripetere a tutti per la famiglia non a costo della famiglia It is always great to be enlivened by the presence of fine priests and seminarians, and you're certainly blessed with the finest priests and the finest seminarians in the Diocese of Arlington. And as I say that, uh, I should thank Bishop Laverty for his kindness in uh, always welcoming me here. It's always a pleasure to be with Bishop Laverty. As a matter of fact, he was the only bishop with me when I had my terrible fall in Baltimore. And he was a true brother in Christ, standing with me by the roadside in Baltimore, waiting for the ambulance. <laughs> It was really a scene. <laughs> and worse than the injuries that I suffered worse was that I was on my way to have an excellent Italian meal with all the bishops of Italian descent. It was Italian league night. And I was so looking forward to it. And when I got to the hospital, I told them about it and they said, well, that's too bad because you can't eat anything for 24 hours anyway. So. I said, well, I have the same sort of storage as a camel, except that it's in the front and not in the back. But I think of the great young men and the sacrifices that they make as they enter the seminary to sacrifice the beautiful goodness of marriage for the sake of the kingdom of God. And I think of the Lord's grace at work in their hearts, pulling them close to himself and pulling them close to the Blessed Mother. 
so that they can make this great sacrifice. So thank you for that, and I hope, dear seminarians, and I hope there will be many to follow your ranks in the future, and as long as Father Fasano lives and breathes, there will be. <laughs> so, I was with a group of former students for the 4th of July, five married couples, and they brought with them their children. Between the five couples, 27 children. <laughs> 27. So we had a pause, and I said, you know, tell me, after all these years, they're coming up on 20, 25 years of marriage now. They have sons and daughters in high school and college. Why do guys get married? Tell me. And they said, that's the easiest question in the world to answer. We get married because we want to find out what's wrong with us. <laughs> On a daily basis. That laughter is a sign of absolute truth. <laughs> about which we'll speak in due time. Right now, we're under the gun because the momentum has so increased toward legalizing, realizing, and so on, same-sex unions. This has happened much more quickly than anyone might have predicted. And it's hard to believe that there isn't some deliberation behind this. It's hard to believe that there isn't some deliberation and a lot of money behind it. However, the danger with this fast pace is that we are scrambling to react. We're scrambling to react. And when we scramble to react, we let the ones who propose what we're reacting to, we let them set the table. We let them determine the arena where the battle is waged. And we wind up trying to speak back to them to react in their own terms, on their own turf. We always do that. We've never been able to get control of the terms of the debate whether it's regard to abortion, whether it's regard with regard to artificial contraception, whether it's with regard to marriage. We've never been able to have that discussion in our terms because we're reacting. And we're reacting because it's too late to be proactive. And being proactive means seeing the big picture, not just reacting to some nasty quip of some anchor man or anchor woman on the news, not just reacting to some lie from a politician like the Supreme Court just made contraception illegal. Specifically, five men did it. That's just silliness. And we get stuck reacting to that kind of stuff. The whole context for this discussion escapes us. The whole context deludes, eludes us. And so what I'd like to do tonight is to talk about that context <clears throat> to 
talk about that context and then I'd like to make some comments about the last apostolic exhortation, the last post-synatal document about the family, Familiaris Consortio, some comments about the instrumentum <coughs> laboris for the upcoming synod of October, and some comments about Cardinal Cosper's proposal. with regard to the pastoral care of the family. So in a rare departure from my usual method, I have four points. And that, I'm sure, will not traumatize you, but it will traumatize me. <laughs> so if there are any problems along the way here, chalk them up to the fact that I'm being traumatized by a fourth point. <laughs> now, one of the biggest problems ever in the history of philosophy is the mind-body split. From St. Thomas Aquinas to the present, Philosophers have proposed what is obvious, really, that the human person, the human being, is a unity. There's one entity there. When you talk about a human person, there's one entity out there that corresponds to the term human person. The human person is a union of many elements, but the human person is a union. Now we talked about this before when Descartes and Kant came along The notion of the human person as a unity receded and we got the notion of a person as a dualism of mind and body. The mind-body split in contemporary philosophy goes back to Descartes and Kant. If you back all the way, it goes back to Plato, clearly. The mind-body split. And that all came about because Descartes defined the human person as a thinking thing. He concluded that he must exist because he thinks. So the mind determines reality. What I think is the case, is the case, if you push that to its extreme. And down through the whole history of human thought, the whole history of philosophy, there has waged this battle as to whether the human being is really a unity or whether the human being is a dualism, a mind body split, where the most important element is what I think. And that's where we are today. I mean, one of the reasons we're having problems with marriage is because of what the instrumentum laboris refers to as gender theory. That is, whether 
I have a masculine, a male body, or a female body, doesn't matter. That can be fixed. <laughs> I am what I think I am. So if I'm convinced that I'm a woman, and I happen to have a male body, well then we get that fixed. We get that fixed. And not only do we get it fixed, but because an individual becomes convinced that he has a male body, but he's really a she, because he's convinced, then he has a right to be a woman. If I need something or I want something in our country and in our culture, all of a sudden I have a right to it. I have a right to it. And the next step, not only do I have a right to it, I have a right to it free of charge because the taxpayers are going to pay for it. I have a right to contraception because I need it and I want it. And not only do I have a right to it, but I have a right to have it at the taxpayer's expense, free of charge to me. If I think I need it, and if I think I want it, I have a right to it. See, reality, apart from the mind, is to be disregarded, modified, thrown out, whatever you want to do. What really matters is what's in the mind. And human life is a big head trip where you're in your world and I'm in mine and we agree to disagree. What you think is wrong is wrong for you. What I think is wrong is wrong for me, but not for you. It's all in the mind. And the fact that there is a very observable difference between a male and a female body. You can't really look at the anatomy and say, I don't see any difference. <laughs> Though, who knows? That might be Pelosi's next statement. <laughs> a few people on the way in asked for red meat, so I'll throw a little bit of that out there. <laughs> It helps us to stay awake in deep philosophic waters. <laughs> All right. So, when we look as human beings with reason at biology, at the anatomical difference between the male body and the female body, when we reason about it, when we reason about what is given in nature, our conclusions of that reasoning are the natural law. We're reasoning about how the physical world presents itself to us and in the first place about how the human physical world presents itself to us. Now, the fact that we can reason about our biology is what makes us human. The dog does not reason about his biology. He waits for the treat. And he does whatever is necessary to get the treat. 
the dog doesn't think anything. Don't get me wrong, I love dogs. But if somebody thinks that a dog thinks, that thinking dog is in their head. It's their head trip. And because they think that a dog thinks doesn't make it think. Unless they believe in the mind-body split, which most in our culture do. So this is why the church's whole teaching on sexual morality is up for grabs. You know, we know that. We know there are people fighting for living together before marriage. We know there are people fighting for same-sex unions. We know there are people fighting for so-called reproductive rights. We know that, and we want to give them a quick response from the hip that will quiet them. It's not possible. Because doing it that way means we're playing on their turf, and we can't win on their turf. This is the only turf that we can win on. And there's a lot of problems with this turf. Lots of problems. That's what the Instrumentum Laboris talks about. The problems with this turf. What we have now is a culture that instead of, is a culture which instead of using real reason to interpret the biological truth, our culture substitutes freedom in the sense of autonomy not based on the truth. <coughs> to enter into dialogue, as it were, with biology. Reason is for the truth. Freedom is for the truth. The way our culture operates, freedom is not limited by the truth. Freedom is absolutely unpredictable. The truth in no way limits it because I am the initiator of reality. Reality doesn't come at me from the outside. It initi it's initiated right here. And since I don't place any limits on my own freedom, in accord with the truth, then the freedom is unlimited and I can do anything. So reason seeks to understand biology and conclude to what we call the natural law. Reason humbles itself. It submits to the order of creation. Freedom seeks to dominate the order of creation. As though the individual, the thinking thing, were God, bringing reality into existence all by himself, right out of his head or her head. Don't try to force me what, to believe what you believe. When you say something is true, that doesn't mean anything except that you are trying to force me to believe what you believe. You're trying to exercise power over me when you say something is true. When you tell me that something is true and I have to believe it too, you are the enemy. That's where we are. That's where we are. So, reason reflecting on nature 
on physical nature and human nature reason draws conclusions which we call the natural law scientists have attacked the natural law for not being scientific it's not scientific science tells us how the body works the science of biology it pictures for us all about how the body works philosophy and theology reflect on what does it mean that it works together so well the body when it's not sick what's the meaning of the human body that's not a scientific question and there will never be a scientific answer to that never so of course it's not a scientific question it's not a scientific issue the mistake they make is when they say well the natural law doesn't square with science therefore forget about it that therefore it doesn't follow the natural law doesn't have to square with science the natural law is not a scientific law it's a law of reason and reason asks the questions about the whys and the meanings of things not just how they work and when reason is discarded and replaced by freedom or autonomy the whole point is to dominate created order in a way that's appropriate only for God so if I find myself with a male body but I'm convinced in my head that I'm a female then we fix that and if I really want to be a female I have a right to be a female and I have a right to have the taxpayers pay for my transformation into a female that's how we talk about rights now I have a right to contraception and I have a right to taxpayer funded contraception I have a right to a same-sex union and I also have a right to call the same-sex union marriage which it could never be but I have a right to it and by God my equal rights will be upheld and my equal rights will prevail over other people's rights they're no better than I am if every human person has a right to marry then I have a right to marry no limits to that this is true one guy was trying to file a suit somewhere to see if he could marry his computer <laughs> I don't know how you'd fit the ring on the computer. Huh? <laughs> I'm worried about the liturgy myself. <laughs> how could we dress the computer up for the wedding? That's not... So, the natural law is the result of reason limiting itself by the truth of nature reading the truth of nature and then lim the nature is what it is and the natural law tells what it is in a way that binds in a way that binds and so if I reasonably reflect on the male body and the female body 
Then, Familiaris Consortio and what followed it, I discover the nuptial meaning of the body. If I look at the male and the female anatomy, it is very obvious that there is possible there a one flesh union. It's the most obvious thing in the world. And this is what blows my mind about all of this. People want to discount biology. Well, without getting crude at all, I want to say to them, can't you see what goes where? <laughs> it's not a mystery. And if in the conjugal communion of marriage there is a one flesh union, that union sometimes is the place where God enters in and occupies the space of the one flesh union and creates a new human life. The one flesh union of husband and wife God made for the husband and wife, for their joy. To help them to celebrate their unselfishness toward each other. But he also created that space of the one flesh union so that he could enter that space and bring new life into the world according to his will. How could it be anything but a serious sin to expel God from the place that he created for himself so that he might bring forth new life? And that's what contraception does. It is the expulsion of God, artificial contraception, is the expulsion of God from the very space that he created for himself. When husband and wife are united in marriage, he says to them, I want to dwell with you in your one flesh union. That's how holy it is. That's why it's a sacrament. Because I want to come there and dwell with you. And according to my will, I can and will bring forth new life from there. Artificial contraception tells God, you can't do that. That's not your space. It's not what you think it is. It's what I think it is. The mind then dominates the body rather than respects the body. St. Paul. You are not your own property. You hear all these people say, well, my body is my property. St. Paul says you are not your own property. You have been purchased and at what a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. Artificial contraception is the redefinition of sexual intercourse. Just like civil unions are redefinition of marriage, same-sex civil unions. Redefine things. The mind is in charge, the body, sorry. The body is dominated by the mind, and then that becomes more and more complicated and snowballing when we get to in vitro fertilization, which is the complete domination of a human being by somebody else's mind. The complete domination 
from the moment of conception. Take it all the way. Take the domination all the way. Not only to dominate my own body and my own human anatomy, but to dominate a third party from the moment of conception. People don't think about these things this way, but that's the way they are. But they don't have to worry about that because the way, the, way, the way they think about it is the way they are. That's our culture. That's our culture. So all the natural law issues are presumed by familiaris consortio. That is, I'm not going to redo them, but we've gone over it before. The existence of God, the unsurpassed dignity of the human person, the truth about marriage, and the irrationality of violence. When we say the natural law, that doesn't exhaust the natural law, but it's the basis for it. The whole natural law flows from those four branches. And when we get to the, to the instrumentum laboris, There'll be an interesting point that's made that I will bring up then. Now, in Familiaris Consortio, one of its most interesting numbers is number 46. Familiaris Consortio, number 6. And there's a sentence there that begins, For this reason the Church openly and strongly defends the rights of the family against the intolerable usurpations of society and the state. This is 1981. In particular, the Synod Fathers before 1981 mentioned the following rights of the family. Now, I don't read to you very often, but there are a lot of these rights and I can't memorize them. So let me read them to you. Try to pay attention because you see that if this had really been taken seriously in 1981, maybe we would be in a different place today. The rights of the family have to be upheld against the intolerable usurpations of society and the state. We are in the age of the seeming triumph of the intolerable usurpations of society and the state against family. Here are the rights. The right to exist and progress as a family, that is to say, the right of every human being, even if he or she is poor, to found a family and to have the adequate means to support it. There's Pope Francis's economic justice right there. That's nothing new. However poor they are, they have a right to found a family and to have adequate means to support it. The right to exercise its responsibility regarding the transmission of life and to educate children. Transmission of life is under domination by the mind, as we just said. And the right to educate children is sinking fast. Sinking fast. The right to the intimacy of conjugal and family life. The right to the stability of the bond and of the institution of marriage. The right to the stability of marriage. 
that right should be upheld by the dismissal of no-fault divorce laws. <clears throat> Civilly. Civil law should uphold the right to the stability of the bond of marriage. The right to believe in and profess one's faith and to propagate it. It's all there, not only in church, but to go out and spread the faith. Look at our freedom of religion. This was 1981. The right to bring up children in accordance with the family's own traditions and religious and cultural values with the necessary instruments, means, and institutions. That means I have a right that my children not be given condoms in the third grade. The right especially of the poor and the sick to obtain physical, social, and economic security. The right of the poor and the sick. The right of seniors not to be a burden because they're families. The right of seniors not to be treated as burdens because they're irrepeatable acts of God with all the human dignity that that entails. The right to housing suitable for living family life in a proper way. Back to economic justice. The right to expression and to representation either directly or through associations before the economic, social, and cultural public authorities and lower authorities. The right to expression and to representation. The right to form associations with other families and institutions in order to fulfill the family's role suitably and expeditiously. The right to protect minors by adequate institutions and legislation from harmful drugs, pornography, alcoholism, etc. So much of the mess that our culture is in is a result to pornography being available just as you touch that computer key. Anything we want. The right to a wholesome recreation of a kind that also fosters family values. <coughs> wholesome right. That means you have a right not to listen to Miley Cyrus. <laughs> The right of the elderly to a worthy life and a worthy death. See, the rights of the family are far-ranging. This was spelled out in 1981. And it seems wasn't taken seriously. And here's the one that clinches it all. The right to emigrate as a family in church in search of a better life. Now it says the right to emigrate as a family <laughs> in search of a better life. As a family. But families do have a right to emigrate in search of a better life. And when that's what families are doing, the mind of Christ says we welcome them and care for them. All of those rights are part of the natural law. As the natural law reflects on the reality of nature, as reason reflects on the reality of nature, these are some of the conclusions that you come to about rights. But when you read that list of rights, there's nothing there that says, I have a right to whatever I like and to whatever I want at no charge. 
to me. That's not in any list of rights anywhere. But those are the rights that certain politicians in this country are the most committed to uphold. But I have a right to whatever it is I want, whatever it is I need, at someone else's expense. I have a right to have Hobby Lobby pay for anything I want. Not just 16 out of 20. They got to pay for 30 if I want them. Because I want them. And whatever is in my mind is the way it goes. You see how we keep coming back to that? I used to tell college students all the time in the 70s and the 80s, the mind-body split is going to ruin society. And we're getting close. We're a lot closer now than we were in the 70s and the 80s. So, familiaris consortio, the nuptial meaning of the body, the sacredness of the one flesh union, the place of God's presence where he can indeed step in and create new life. A space, the one flesh union that belongs to God in a very special way. Now, the instrumentum laboris for the synod. What is an instrumentum laboris? It means the outline of the work we're going to do. The Instrumentum Laboris is not a document that offers Catholic teaching. It's an agenda for a meeting. This is what we're going to talk about this October when the Synod gets together. The Synod means it's an extraordinary Synod. It means all the presidents of the bishops' conferences throughout the world and a small group of others that the Holy Father appoints. An extraordinary synod is different from a general synod. When we have the general synod in 2016, we bishops get to elect other bishops besides the president of the conference to go it's bigger. So even this extraordinary synod coming up in October is preparatory for another larger synod to be held in a year, 2016. So this is the agenda for the meeting. These are the questions that we want to talk about. And they're all the questions with regard to the family that we've discussed some more, that we've discussed so far. And then some. Then there are more issues to be brought up. But the real underlying issue of the Synod, which just stays beneath every question and every topic, is the mind-body split. And if one were to read the Instrumentum Laboris that way, you see that it's about many different issues. But in the end, it's about one thing. The relationship of the human mind to the truth. Whether human freedom is meant to dominate nature and biology, or whether human reason should be accountable to nature and so direct freedom according to the natural law. Our culture says freedom is unlimited with regard to reality because my mind can fashion of reality 
whatever it wants to fashion. But the tradition of the church and of solid philosophy says freedom is limited by the natural law. But how do you think the mind works? What do you think the mind is for? See, and that particular issue never comes up. So, when we enter into these discussions, the presumption is in favor of the mind-body split, and we're playing on the field of our adversaries. And it's no wonder we don't do that well, because we're not really getting at the heart of the matter. Is the human being a unity, or is the human being a dualism? And does the mind rule all of nature, or is the mind subject to nature? Is the order of creation to be taken seriously, or is it something to be ignored by human domination? The Instrumentum Laboris makes it clear that in our own time, the natural law, which is to be the, supposed to be supposed to be the common ground, so that there can be dialogue in communities, so that there can be solidarity. The natural law is relative. The natural law is whatever you think it is. The Instrumentum Laboris says, that's the big problem. Whatever you think that natural law is, that's what it is. And so there is no natural law. It's still all in my mind. And when I play my mind game, everything else is subject to that. And boy, am I powerful. Again, I don't want to be crude, but it amazes me that so many people who feel so powerful to change the order of creation that came right from God If they feel so powerful, why is there such a demand for Viagra? <laughs> and so, the ecology of human nature is the kind of language that the Instrumentum Laboris suggests that we use when we talk about the natural law. People believe in preserving the right order of nature when they want to preserve the spotted owl, or when they want to preserve a snail that crosses the road near the Columbia River. They believe in protecting the ecology of nature. What about the ecology of human nature? On the one hand, they want to protect the ecology of nature, and they say there is no ecology of human nature. The ecology of human nature is whatever I want it to be, whatever I think it is. That's the problem. That's the problem. And we've been playing the game on the field of the adversaries for so long. It's a real question as to whether we can move the game back onto our field. It's not a question as to whether the gates of hell might prevail against the church. That can never happen. But that's a statement about the universal church. Christ never said to Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church in the United States. 
that promise was never made. And when you have a president and an administration that reject the natural law in regulations and in executive orders and in legislation, every chance they get without shame, the natural law really is in trouble. And the American people have voted for this situation now twice. So, I think it would be helpful if rather than saying natural law, we started to talk about the ecology of human nature. Whether or not that's going to make a big difference, at this point, I do not know. One of the reasons why I'm staying fat is so that I'm prepared for the great persecution. <laughs> I've said to the doctor many times, this is no time to lose weight. <laughs> this is, given what could happen here, fat is beautiful. <laughs> I also tell them, I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I'm celibate. What more do you want from me? <laughs> So, the fourth point, Cardinal Casper. Now, everybody's been talking about this synod, and one of the hot topics of the synod is, what about those people who are divorced they remarried without an annulment, and they can't go to communion. Well, with a great deal of compassion, the response to that is, well, what about them? What about them? We care about them. We want to reach out to them. We want to keep them coming to church. They need to keep coming to church. However, what is the truth of their situation? When they're divorced and remarried without an annulment, they are not in full communion with the church. Their communion with the church is imperfect. There's something there that needs to be rectified. Now, and so, some of the cardinals are saying, should we streamline the annulment process? Well, that statement is made from a European perspective. The annulment process is so streamlined in the United States, it's really streamlined. I mean, it is computerized up the wazoo, and things go as quickly as possible. What slows down the pace of annulments in the United States? It's one thing. Testimony is needed from witnesses. And there are all sorts of reasons why witnesses don't want to give testimony in an annulment case. And those who want to give it, there are all sorts of reasons why they delay. What is the truth of the first marriage and its status? We can't find that out without witnesses. So if the witnesses don't come forward in a timely way, everything grinds to a halt on a particular case. In my chancery, in the tribunal, we have a wall. And it has kind of a map on it. 
and on the map appear all the cases that are currently under consideration. And the preponderance of cases on that map are held up right at the point where it says testimony of witnesses received. They move right along and they come to a grinding halt right there. And we have every opportunity for witnesses to testify. They can come in and give their testimony. They can make an appointment, come in, give their testimony to one of the tribunal people, and then they're finished. Doesn't take any more than an hour. But there are a lot of human reasons why people don't want to give their testimony, or if they're willing to give it when they sit down, they think they don't know what to say. That's why decrees of nullity are delayed for the most part in the country. I mean, the way the computers are running, it couldn't go any faster. So anyway, that's the issue. These people who would like to go to communion, they can't because they're in imperfect communion with the church. And they hesitate to get an annulment because it takes so long. What about them? Jesus Christ said, the two husband and wife will cling to each other and the two will become one flesh. Therefore, let no one separate what God has joined. When we talk about second marriages with, without an annulment of the first, we're talking about something that Jesus himself said was impossible in the Gospels. We're talking about the words of Jesus. So, how someone could enter a second marriage with the truth in the background that the first marriage is still valid, that's just impossible. It's not that we don't care about the individuals, we do care. We'd like to find ways to keep them close to the church. I hope that's what the Synod is going to uh, come up with, try to come up with. But the one thing we can't do is say, well, if you're bound by a previous marriage, even though Jesus said that's indissoluble, we're going to fix that somehow. And that's basically what Cardinal Cosper came up with. He said maybe we could have second marriages in the church where the person was still bound by the first marriage. We could do that and we could say that that second marriage is not accepted by the church, but it's tolerable. It's not accepted, but it's tolerable. Now, uh, I think, I honestly think that Cardinal Cosper knows a lot of people, and I do too, who are in that situation. And I think he really feels bad for them, and I think he's trying to bend over backwards to find some way. But when you're dealing with the words of Jesus himself in the Gospels, there just is no way. And to say we're going to make a, a distinction between what's acceptable and what's tolerable is another story. Because we talk about the toleration of evil. Well, the state in our Catholic tradition may tolerate evil. But the state even may never promote evil. The state tolerate the fact that people use artificial contraception? Of course the state can do that. 
how would you enforce the law against artificial contraception? The state can tolerate that evil, but the state cannot say, you've got a right to artificial contraception and we're going to make somebody else pay for it. That's not tolerating evil, that's promoting evil. And even the state can't do that. The church cannot tolerate evil. The church proclaims the victory over sin and death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave us the, re the resurrection power so that evil might be wiped out. Not so that we look for ways to tolerate it. So to say, let's tolerate those second marriages where there's still a bond of a previous marriage, it just can't be. The church doesn't tolerate evil. And Jesus Christ himself said, what the Lord has joined, no one may divide. There's no way to get around the words of Christ. But there are plenty of ways in which people can be made to feel at home in church even without receiving communion. There is a strange idea out there, and I don't know where it came from, very strange idea, that if you're not going to receive communion, you might as well not go to Mass. Somehow your presence at Mass is not valid unless you receive communion. The church never taught that, ever. That's why I don't know where that comes from. Well, I do know where it comes from. It comes from the fact that everybody comes up for communion by rows, and people are embarrassed not to get up there and receive. When are they getting there? But how could the discipline of the church be the result of how the ushers send people up for communion? <laughs> That's where it came from. Am I going to be the only one in my row? If everybody else goes out, now we have the quasi solution of well, come up and get a blessing, which is all right. But we should just get real about things like that and say it's a responsible Catholic behavior to refrain from receiving communion when you were not disposed. And, you know, that doesn't mean if somebody doesn't receive communion that they're in mortal sin. No one should make that judgment. It might simply mean that, say, a husband had had a terrible fight with the visiting mother-in-law <laughs> before they left for church and he lost it. It's probably not a mortal sin, but he just doesn't, you know, after the way we talk to each other, I don't think I should run right up and receive Jesus Christ into my heart. I'm really not disposed. That's responsibility. And for people to judge that if somebody doesn't go to communion, they committed a mortal sin, is way beyond the pale. That's one of those cases where who am I to judge should be applied. But we do need to find ways to meet people in that situation who wish they could receive communion, they don't know about spiritual communion. If they know it, they kind of don't buy it. We got to do everything we can to reach out and help them and make them welcome. We really do. But we can't do that at the expense of the truth about marriage that Christ himself proclaimed in the gospel. Because the church Unlike society, unlike the state, which can tolerate evil, the church is not in the business of tolerating evil. 
the church proclaims and lives out the once for all triumph over evil of Jesus Christ and his glorious resurrection. That's what the church does. So Cardinal Cosper is trying to do a good thing in a way, but it doesn't seem to be too promising an approach simply because there are too many obstacles. So, if we look at the context, we look at the nuptial meaning of the body in Familiaris Consortio, we look at the Instrumentum Laboris, and we look at Cardinal Cosper's proposal, we don't arrive at any other conclusion than that we still need common ground for dialogue, and that that common ground is going to be what maybe we used to call the natural law, but which we now could call the ecology of human nature. And our ability to communicate about that has to do with our ability to argue against dualism and to argue against human life as a head trip, where I create my wonderful world and I just live there and everything is always the way I want or as much as possible. And if it's not the way I want, of course, I have a right that it be different and I have a right to have somebody else pay for that. We're in quite a difficult situation. But Jesus Christ is still risen from the dead and as difficult as the situation is, that difficult situation will not be the end of us. In the big picture, this is a train headed for heaven. And anyone who wants to head for heaven is on that train and is welcome on that train. So let's stay riding on that train together in faith and enjoy and that faith and joy will come upon us because as we ride on that train the way we keep the train going is not coal but that train keeps pushing forward on the power of unselfish love unselfish charity so thanks for listening to me tonight praise be Jesus Christ really the toleration of um, marriage? I mean, really? I wouldn't say that because when uh, Christ gave Peter the, the power of binding and loosing, that's where the power to declare a marriage invalid would reside, in that binding and loosing. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So if through the apostles and their successors something on earth is loosed, it will be loosed in heaven, and that goes well beyond some tolerance. Okay? Father, uh, science is that there is no genders other than man and woman. That's been... That's science. Why don't we use science to say that only man and woman? There are not there are not these thirty-one genders that they, they come out with out there. Well I appreciate right there. I appreciate that question, but the question should really be why don't they accept science? Because the same is true when we say that a human life begins with the fertilization of the egg. That's science. There's no question about that in science. And yet, the Supreme Court and others will call that such a deep, mysterious, philosophical, theological area. It's straightforward sophomore year biology in high school. Why? Well, because in this culture, they follow what they want to follow. 
They like this kind of biology, they don't like that. And we see it every day, the double standard. It's the way our country and our culture live. And we, I don't do it, you don't do it, but they do it. And that's because they've got the playing field and people are growing along. Oh, oh, I know. I know. But, dear, we know that there's plenty of baloney that's published. <laughs> I mean, just... <laughs> Look at, look at the New York Times and the National Catholic Reporter. <laughs> a, a, a question coming in online, I believe it's from Vera. Uh, does the church have an official position of how to deal with frozen embryos that exist by the thousands around the world? Frozen embryos will eventually die if they're not used and implanted. Um, right now the teaching of the church is that there are two ways of looking at the use of frozen embryos. Uh, one can say that it would be a rescue operation, rescue a life, to have that uh, embryo implanted, whereas simply leaving it frozen would amount to killing it. There's another position that says letting the embryo die would be better than committing the moral evil of surrogate motherhood because letting something die is a moral evil, it is a, is a non-moral evil, and surrogate motherhood is a moral evil. And a non-moral evil is always lesser than a moral evil. Uh, it seems that that position is going to prevail, but right now, Catholics, there's what, there's what they call a real moral doubt. So if somebody says, the way I say it, I'm saving a child, that's acceptable. If somebody says it would be more morally sound to allow an embryo to die than to enter into surrogate motherhood, that's acceptable. Both are acceptable right now. Thank you both. Uh, I'm Thomas, and uh, you've opened my eyes to the reality of uh, human unity. You never quite thought about it like that. The oneness of the person. The oneness of the person, right. It appears as though there's been a massive deception perpetrated on Western culture, if you will. And as it go back to the line in Genesis 3, which says, where you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Did the devil know that it was not, it was, it was a tree in the center of the garden? Deception begins right there. That's right. He did. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, how often are we being deceived? Plenty. The popular culture. Plenty. Especially by mainstream television and by the papers. I mean, if you read the uh, Wisconsin State Journal in Madison, you would think that I was the meanest creature on the face of the earth. <laughs> And you can see that I'm nothing but a big, fuzzy, chubby teddy bear. <laughs> Did you see, by the way, a little while back, the politician that got in trouble? He thought the microphone was off and it was on. And he referred to a school board member as Chubby Wubby. <laughs> And he got in a lot of trouble like that, and I, I reacted immediately. I said, why should anybody get in trouble for just saying what's obviously true? <laughs> and I told my staff, one-to-one, -one, in the privacy of my office, you can call me Chubby Wubby whenever you want. <laughs> what advice might you have for parents? Of young children to combat the homosexual agenda that uh, creeps into families in the most uh, unpredicted manner. 
uh, you, uh, I myself as a father uh, who uh, sees it to preserve innocence in my children and uh, with my wife, fosters a prayer life and is centered on the church, yet still, even a month ago, I had my eight-year-old daughter come home and ask if men can marry men and women can marry women, because it's something they hear from other children at uh, school uh, of other influences in society. And we feel very ill-equipped as parents with uh, how that can be addressed, especially in the innocence of children as you're dealing with uh, sexual orientation. Well, I think we all know that for the government schools, there is a whole program of indoctrination, which is uh, social engineering, just as they're trying to do in the military. The latest thing now is they want to make sure that transvestites have a right to go in the military. Well. Our military is not going to be able to scare anybody in a while, I guess that's... <laughs> I don't mean that as a dig, I mean that as a fact. I mean, some people, you can guess who, don't seem to know what the military is. And uh, no, I don't think there's any way that it, uh, young people can be isolated from this. I think that... Um, the absence of television in their life, you know, where there are all these situational comedies that include same-sex couples and show how nice they are and how everybody takes it for granted. And I think uh, that has to be excluded at home. Uh, if they're in a, in a government school and this is what's happening, there's, I mean, parents can protest, but I suppose there's not too much they can do about it because the government has taken an official stand against the natural law. And uh, how does one defend oneself from a government that has taken a public stand against the natural law? I really don't quite know. Well, they, they, yeah, they could do that, but they could do that, but I, I just wonder how much of that would be tolerated. There's some kind of a military force associated with the Department of Homeland Security, I'm told. And uh, they're there, they're real, and they're very heavily armed. I don't know if any... I've seen members of this force occasionally, but they're... I don't know, I think they were guarding some celebrity at a golf outing or something like that. But, so I, I don't know what they're really up to, but I wonder. But I, I don't think there'd be much uh, tolerance of uh, civil disobedience. Um, see, we're, we're, in a, we're in a terrible position of darned if we do and darned if we don't. I mean, this terrible situation on the southern border. On the one hand, it's kids. It's kids. But on the other hand, I think somebody, again, planned the transportation, the financing, and all of that, too. So what about that size of, side of it? It's just, it's very difficult to be a parent. And God bless you, I think uh, what we all have to do is pray for parents of younger children every blessed day. And I do that myself, that you have the strength and the wisdom. But there's no way to isolate somebody from this stuff in an absolute way, especially if they go to a government school. And sometimes Catholic schools can't be trusted either, certain ones. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. We know you're on a very tight schedule. We appreciate you coming to see you.